let's talk about microservice architecture. And this architecture is critical for building scalable, decoupled, and maintainable applications. On the left, we have the client devices, for example, PC or mobile. And this is the interaction layer. So client devices, whether based on web-based, for example, PC or mobile, they will initiate HTTP or HTTPS requests. And these can also be REST or gRPC-based requests, depending on the architecture's communication pattern. But HTTP and HTTPS are common for requests. And clients typically consume APIs exposed by the backend via the API gateway. We also have the Content Delivery Network, or CDN, and it's primarily responsible for serving static content like CSS, JS, images on a global scale. So this improves load times by reducing the distance between the client and the server. So it will offload traffic from the backend and reduce the need for the core application to handle static assets. So the CDN is providing caching, which reduces origin server load and improves latency. So providers include services like Cloudflare, AWS CloudFront, and Akamai. So that's very typical for uh, CDN. We also have the load balancer, which acts as a traffic distributor that spreads incoming client requests evenly across multiple API gateway instances or microservices. And this ensures the system remains responsive even under high traffic conditions. Let's discuss the microservice architecture. So we have the client devices, PC or mobile, and this is the interaction layer where the client devices, whether web-based, for example, PC or mobile, initiate HTTP or HTTPS requests. These requests can be REST or gRPC-based, depending on the architecture's communication pattern. And the clients typically consume APIs exposed by the backend via the API gateway. We also have the Content Delivery Network, or CDN, and it's primarily responsible for serving static content, like CSS, JS, images on a global scale. And this improves load times by reducing the distance between the client and the server. So it offloads traffic from the backend, reducing the need for the core application to handle static assets. So CDNs provide caching, which reduces origin server load and improves latency. So services like Cloudflare, AWS, CloudFront, and Akamai are typically used. The load balancer acts as a traffic distributor that spreads incoming client requests evenly across multiple API gateway instances, because the API gateway might have to scale horizontally or directly to different microservices if there's no API gateway. And this ensures the system remains responsive even under high traffic conditions. There's different types. It can be layer four, for example, TCP and UDP, or layer seven, HTTP or HTTPS, based on the OSI model and common services are uh, AWS Elastic Load Balancer, or ELB, or Nginx. It also provides health checks, so it can continuously monitor the health of the instances and reroutes traffic if an instance fails. Another feature is sticky sessions, so this is an optional feature, to ensure that requests from the same client are always sent to the same instance when session state needs to be maintained. So health checks and sticky sessions are features of this load balancer. The API gateway is a reverse proxy. So what does reverse proxy mean? It means that it will route the incoming API requests from the client to the appropriate downstream microservice. So it shields the internal microservice complexity from the client and centralizes several cross-cutting uh, concerns. And there's some core features that are important to the API gateway, for example, rate limiting. It controls the number of requests a client can make in a given period. Also, authentication and authorization. So the API gateway is often integrated with 
OAuth 2.0 or JWT tokens to authenticate and authorize client requests before forwarding them to microservices. It also offers SSL termination, which means that it will terminate the HTTPS connection and handle the encryption and decryption of requests to reduce the overhead on the microservices. Also, the API Gateway provides request aggregation. So sometimes it aggregates multiple service responses into one payload for efficiency purposes. So examples of API Gateway would include AWS API Gateway, Kong, and Nginx. Now we have the microservices, so service A, service B, and service C. One core piece of microservices is that they're independently scalable components, meaning that each microservice encapsulates a specific business function. For example, uh, service A could be a user service. Service B could be an order service. Service C could be a payments service. So they communicate through lightweight protocols such as HTTP, REST, gRPC, or even an event bus or message brokers, for example, RabbitMQ or Kafka. And there's a database per service. So each microservice has its own dedicated database. And this ensures data encapsulation and independent scaling. And it also prevents cross-service failures and simplifies data ownership. So this is a explicit design pattern where we have a one-to-one -one service to database. So one possible issue is that it may lead to data duplication and uh, the eventual consistency pattern where services need to share data. In terms of deployment, microservices can be containerized using Docker and orchestrated with Kubernetes for load balancing and failover management. Now we have the databases. So one aspect of databases is what is referred to as polyglot persistence. So each microservice might use a database technology that's suited to its requirements. For example, SQL for transactional data or NoSQL for high throughput. So this allows for optimized performance, but introduces the complexity of managing different database types. It also offers transactions. So since each microservice maintains its own database, transactions that span multiple services are complex. So in such cases, distributed transactions or the SEGA pattern is often employed to maintain consistency across these services. We also have a Redis cache. So this is an in-memory data store used to cache frequently accessed data, such as session information, configuration values, or database query results to reduce database load and speed up responses. So Redis supports various advanced data structures, such as lists, sets, sorted sets, hashes, allowing to serve more complex caching needs like leaderboards or real-time analytics or rate limiting. And cached entries often have a TTL or time to live to ensure that they don't become stale and are updated regularly. Another aspect of this microservice architecture is the event bus, and this facilitates asynchronous communication. So an event-driven architecture is facilitated using this bus, for example, Kafka, RabbitMQ, AWS SQS, and SNS, and it allows services to communicate asynchronously and promotes decoupling. So there's an event publishing mechanism where the microservices publish events. For example, user is registered or order is created and other services, potentially multiple services, subscribe to those events. And this allows services to react to changes without tight coupling between the services themselves. And it also facilitates item potency. So this ensures that services can handle duplicate messages in the case of retries, which is critical in distributed environments where network failures may result in duplicate events. Finally, we have the management and orchestration. So the management layer is responsible for the orchestration of microservice deployments, ensuring service discovery, load balancing, and scaling. And it manages the life cycle of these microservices, includes uh, including scaling up, 
scaling down based on traffic demands. And common tools for this orchestration layer includes Kubernetes for container orchestration, uh, console for service discovery, and Prometheus for monitoring. 